can't wash away my sin It's nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again It's nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone It's nothing but the blood of good that I have done. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the blood that makes me white as snow. No other found I know. It's nothing This is all my hope and peace. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Thank you, Lord. It's nothing but the blood of Jesus. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? And are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed? In the blood of the Lamb Lay aside all the garments That are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain It's flowing for the soul unclean Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed in the blood the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb and are your garments spotless are they white as snow are you washed in the blood of the Lamb there is power power wonder working in the blood of the Lamb there is power
the name of the Lord. Welcome to New Beginnings Worship Center. This is Pentecost Sunday, and you're in a place where the power of God dwells. For the last 50 days, day and night, 24 hours a day, our upper room has been open. And our goal and my goal beginning was that we at least have 120 visits there uh, during this time, but we were well over 300 visits. Amen. Thank be to God. That means somebody's been spending some time in prayer. Somebody's been believing God for some great things. And we've seen uh, great things happen this past week, especially so many people that we've been praying for. Um, one lady we prayed for on Thursday, uh, they were disconnecting her from, uh, from uh, uh, event. And they told their family that she would be going home. Well, on Friday, she was sitting up. Thanks be to God. God is moving. He's still the divine healer. Amen. He's here to meet whatever need that you have. If we can just trust Him, believe in His Word, hold fast to His promises. Amen. God is so good. We want to make all of you welcome. Any first time guests with us besides our guest speaker, any other first time guests with us today for the very first time? All right. Perhaps not, but it's good to see some returning people. Good to see uh, Crystal and Kenny. It's good to see Kenny. It's good to see Teresa. Amen. Others that have been away for a while. Thank you for being here today. Amen. I want you to know we've been praying for you. Amen. We've been praying for you. And we're just excited to be able to worship with you today. And I'm believing God's going to do great things in this place this morning. I believe backsliders can come home. Sinners can be saved. Bodies can be healed. Lives can be transformed because there's still power in the blood of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Let's go to Him in prayer right now. Then we're going to receive our offering. We're going to bless and pray over our sozo gifts and pledges. And we're going to get right into worship today. And just let God have His way. Father, we come to You right now to give praise and honor unto You for who You are. You're on the throne today. And governments and nations may rise and fall, but You're forever. You change not. Your power is not diminished. Your authority reigns supreme. God, I give You praise. For the opportunity to be in this place this morning. And it's not about the place that we call the church. But it's the assembling of the body of Christ together. Whether that's in a building or outside or under a tent. It doesn't matter Lord. But when your body comes together. You're in the midst of. You're in our presence right now. And we thank you for that. I'm asking for a blessing upon those that came today. Those that are bereaved, broken hearted. Those that are dealing with personal struggles and anxieties and, and, and issues in their life. Lord, I pray that during this service that you would just speak to their hearts. That you would remind them of your eternal love. That you would remind them that they go through nothing, that you're not there. God, I pray that you would embrace that one that feels the farthest away. Breathe on us today. As you did with 120 in the upper room. I pray that you would breathe on us, O oh Lord. Not just so that we would speak in tongues. But so that we would be filled with your power. Lord, that we would be filled with authority. Courage to take your gospel to every person we meet. And every place we go. God, I'm believing that this church is going to be radically transformed today and we're never going to be the same after what you're doing in this place today. I give you praise in Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. Put your hands together once again and give the Lord an ovation of praise. Turn around and wave at somebody. Let them know you're glad to see them in the house of the Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. How many is ready to worship the Lord? Amen. 
Hallelujah. Bubby, how's your dad today? Hallelujah. Praise God. Still coming home on Monday? Praise the Lord. Another praise report. Amen. 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 Are you ready to worship the Lord in giving? Let us agree together as we bless and say these confessions over our giving and over the offering today. Amen. God is doing great things. Amen. And because of who He is and because of your faithfulness to Him, we're going to be able to bless Sozo with this offering today. Amen. So we want you to give as unto the Lord. We're going to bless this offering. We're going to bless our gift to Sozo and as well as our pledges monthly going to Sozo because we want to see people that are bound in addictions freed. We want to see them free and in the house of the Lord serving the one who sets us free. Amen. Hallelujah. Father, in the name of Jesus, we come into your presence thanking you for the New Beginnings Church. You have called us to take the gospel to Nicholas County, to West Virginia, and to the nations of the world. We are a growing body of believers, and there is no division among us because you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider. We have everything we need to fulfill the Great Commission. We are your people filled with your spirit and walking in your love. We are doers of the word and not hearers only. We lift our hands and worship you with these gifts. And as we give in the offering today, we are thanking you for jobs and better jobs, raises and bonuses, sales and commissions, settlements, estates and inheritance, interest and income, rebates and returns, rents and royalties, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, debts demolished. It's offering time and we are thankful that we have this opportunity to give. Hallelujah! 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 Counts the stars on and on. Those of us saying this on the shore. Sees every sparrow that fall. Made the mountains and the seas. He's control of everything. Every creature great and small. He knows my name.
my name Every step that I take Tell you what tomorrow might bring. Can't tell you what's in store. I don't know a lot of things. Don't have all the answers to the questions in life. But I know who I know. And he knows my name. Every step that I take.
Praise the Lord. Thank God for the blood of Jesus Christ. For without the blood, there is no remission of sins. The sins of my past may not be forgiven by those that I transgressed against. But my Heavenly Father sees them no more because of the blood of his precious son hallelujah I believe that I can safely declare that God is in the house can I get a witness I believe the Lord is in this house Praise the Lord. You can be seated. The gentleman that's about to come to bring the word this morning has been a friend of mine since 1999. I used to be terrified of this man. My first pastorate of a little church, a little cinder block building on the corner of Jackson and 3rd in Madison, West Virginia began to radically come alive people were parking everywhere even in places where they shouldn't and we were loud and noisy and our neighbors couldn't stand us and on Sunday mornings 
they'd send a trooper or a state police or a city cop to check us out. We had no air conditioning or very little air conditioning, so the door was always open. And it was only about three steps or five steps maybe from the door to the, to the curb. And I'd see that car circling. And I'll never, and then after a few weeks of that, he parked right in front of the door. A few weeks after that, I saw him get out. He came and he sat in the little vestibule, which was about an eight by eight square. And I trembled thinking, he's going to drag me out of here. But then I found him to be a brother in Christ. Found him at our altar praying, fully uniformed, gun and all, and on duty. We've been friends ever since. And I not only love this man, I admire him. He's been through it, as we all have. But through it all, through it all, the Lord has sustained him, strengthened him, called him to preach. And this man is full of the Word of God. I want you to give a great new beginning, Summersville, West Virginia, welcome to my friend and my brother, John Workman. I'll probably let the microphone go here shortly. I get a little carried away. Yeah, what Stacy probably forgot to tell you is I usually come in when I was on duty and I was sitting in the back. As you can see, I just can't stop crying. And I don't care, you know, being in uniform. Yeah, give God a praise. Give God a praise. I wouldn't trade the tears for anything. Sometimes I laugh. Sometimes I cry. Sometimes I shout. Sometimes I speak in tongues. Sometimes I just sit there and just soak in his presence. Oh, there's nothing that can take away the presence of God. Nothing. It's the most valuable thing that you've got. <laughs> Hey, hallelujah to God. We'll do a little introduction here. I'm John. I've been married to my beautiful wife for 20-some years now. I've got two beautiful girls. One just graduated college. We got her an apartment in Charleston there, which I don't like. <laughs> it's kind of hard letting go. But we got her in, and she's, uh, she's working now. She uh, had a situation. She was in internship. And uh, I said, well, maybe you should let them know that you're interested once you graduate, you're getting ready to graduate. I said, Dad, I don't want to do that. I said, well, okay, just a suggestion, basically. So she went to praying. She said, Lord, if you want me to work here, if, you want, if this is your will for me to work here, then let them ask me. I don't think it was the end of the week that they come and ask her. <laughs> I mean, my God. Yeah. My, other, my other girl, she's getting ready to, you know, she's... Uh, She's in 11th grade because of this COVID stuff. She's going to have to do that again. So we're going to be a little late on getting her to college, but we're trusting God for that. But God has blessed me so immensely. And I, I'm going to preach today. Is that okay? God has been good to me, my brother. I can look back. Everything I've ever been through, it's been worth it. Everything I've ever been through has been worth it. And I want to give a credit and honor to whom honors do. This man has always been a mentor to me. A role model, I've always looked up to him, and you, I hope you know what you got. That's it, God, give God glory. You give God glory, give God glory. This man and this woman is some of the greatest people of God that I've ever been privileged to get to know. And not only do they preach the word of God, they live it. And you know what, if you ain't figured this out yet, people are not going to listen to what you got to say until they see how you live. Yeah, that's where the power of God's at. You can talk a good game, but when it comes to living, and I'll go ahead and tell you ahead of time, I'm not going to apologize. I'm pretty blunt. 
When the Holy Ghost gets stirred up, I'm pretty blunt and I'm devastatingly honest. Sometimes I don't think that's a good thing, but ultimately I believe that it is. But I just want to thank God, you know, to be here. It's an honor and it's a privilege. And of course you can see, obviously, I'm not as good looking a guy as your pastor. <laughs> he's smarter and he's very much more eloquent spoken than I am. Was that good? <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm glad to be here I'm glad to be here Thank you for letting me come up uh, I've evangelized for years I'm getting ready to get started I just want to give you a little overview I've evangelized for many years now And uh, I told Pastor Stacy here Sometime back probably two or three years ago I think I was in the car And I was driving along And uh, the Holy Spirit prompted my heart Anybody know that the Holy Ghost still talks? Amen. Oh he talks And you just, we just got to listen and he spoke to my heart, and, and he, he, he told me, you know, I'm going to make you a pastor. You know, and you're going to be an overseer, a leader in the body of Christ, you know, a shepherd. You're going to feed the flock. And I thought, I mean, I, I, think, I thought I was doing that, Lord. I said, Lord, I'm more of an evangelist. And, man, he said, you're whatever I want you to be. <laughs> I said, okay, Lord, yay, Lord. And I could stand up here all day and tell you, you know, so many different experiences, how the Holy Ghost has told me things, and you watch it happen. I mean, our God is awesome God. I, and I can stand up here and say, I got a wonderful wife, children. God's blessed me with a job. I, I'm a blessed man. I'm a rich man. But the greatest thing that I've got is that I can stand up here and boldly say that I belong to God, that my name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and should I take my last breath here, it's my first breath there. There is no greater privilege than to be a child of God. There ain't nothing in this world worth it. There's nothing in this world any greater than it. That Jesus is mine and I am Jesus. He's my inheritance and I'm his inheritance. So the greatest thing is knowing the Lord Jesus Christ and that Holy Ghost witness that makes you aware. Oh, this thing about not having that witness to let you know who you belong to. Oh, glory to God. If you don't care, let's stand up and let's go to the Lord in prayer because without the anointing of the Holy Ghost, and I've had church already. So, you know, it might be 10 minutes, it might be an hour. We're just going to let the Holy Ghost have his way because I learned a long time ago the hard way that when the anointing's done, I'm done. You know, I can't preach without him. So, Father, we come unto you in the blessing, the holy name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't try to approach you in any other name or any other way because there is no other. There is only one name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved and that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, his shed blood and his resurrection. Thank you for Jesus, Father. And thank you, Jesus, that you give us the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Father, that we are born again and our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. I pray today, dear God, that, Lord, you will fill my heart, dear Lord with rivers of living water, that it may flow through my belly, Lord, and that you will use me, dear God, to, be, to make a spiritual impartation, dear God, that your people can go out here with some pep in their step. And I know they will already, Father, but I pray, dear God, when the time comes to where they don't feel that pep in their step, dear God, they can stand on the Word of God and know that the written Word of God is just par as, as powerful as when they feel something. That the written word of God, it's, Lord, it's never going to move. It's a sure foundation. I pray, dear God, that you open their hearts, dear God. They can receive this word, Lord, when the enemy comes because he's always going to come. There's always going to be a fight until we meet you in the air. And I pray, dear God, that there will be a spiritual impartation, dear God. Lord, meet for the souls of your people, dear God. And not only, dear God, will you feed them, but you'll use it to feed others, dear God. I pray to God not to say any more or any less what you would have me to say. And I pray that the anointing of the Spirit of God will take over, God. Let us rejoice in the truth, Father. Your name be glorified. Your name be magnified. And your purpose be fulfilled in your people, Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. We also all say amen. amen. Thank you, Jesus. If you got to have a little title... Let me show you something here. One of my congregation members had this made for me. I'm kind of proud of it. I, I sweat a lot when I preach. So, she, I guess it looks like now I'm going to get on the right side. Okay. She made this for me because she knows how I sweat. I always got to do this. And she put it at the bottom here. She said, Reverend John Workman, DD. She said, I know that you don't have a doctrine of divinity. So here's what it means. Devil disturber. <laughs> yeah.
Yes, I, I definitely don't have a doctrine of divinity. I'm just no country boy. And what I learned, I had to say, God, please, what's this mean? What's that mean? <laughs> but I can assure you that I am definitely a devil stirrer, and I give God the glory and the honor yeah. for it. But if we can. <laughs> and you are too, every one of us. Every true born-again child of God is a devil disturber. If you truly know him, you're disturbing the devil. Amen. But if you got to have a, a title for the message today, I want to call it Logos and Lions, Rhema and Serpents. Yeah, I kind of like it. <laughs> and we'll take our text starting off in 2 Timothy chapter 4. And we'll, uh, we'll start at, let me find it here. Let's look at 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me, this is the Apostle Paul, and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every work, evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Now apparently Paul had went somewhere and he had stirred up the devil. But he said he was preaching the gospel and they apparently had put him in a situation where they were going to throw him to the lines. Now, we know that this was a physical incident, but I like to look at things at a spiritual turn. The scripture says, To humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, and casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour, whom resists steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. But the God of all grace who hath called you unto his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after that you have suffered a while, will make you perfect, strengthen, and settle you. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. But I want to talk a little bit about a lion today, and I'm going to give you a little bit of my testimony. And how many of you know that when you first come to Jesus Christ, you hear the stories how, how glorious it is. But I've learned a long time ago that the Christian life is bittersweet. If you look in the book of Revelation chapter 10, I think there was a situation with the apostle John. And he was told to go take a little book out of the hand of the angel. And he said, eat it up. And when you eat it up, it'll be sweet as honey to your mouth, but it'll make your belly bitter. So I'm here to tell you, as glorious as it is serving God, and it's so much glorious, Paul said, for I reckon that the present sufferings cannot be accounted to the glory that shall be revealed in us. If we suffer with him, Christ, we shall also reign with him. Though he were a son, the son, yet learned he obedience by the things that he suffered. So as glorious as it is here, you still have an enemy. His name's Satan, and he withdrew a third of the angels from heaven. He also works through the first Adam nature. And I wish that I had about two months to preach this. We're only going to touch the surface of this. But I don't want to go beyond the Holy Ghost. But not only did I learn these things out of many, many hours in the Scriptures and many hours in prayer, but through experience. I know what it's like to fight the devil. I know what it's like to get in a fight with the enemy to where nobody else can help me. I know what it's like at 3 o'clock in the morning that I'm laying in a fetal position because the devil's got me all twisted up. And I know as much as you would like to help me, as much as my pastor friends would like to help me, and they would do what they could, they can only go so far. You and me have a limit as people, and even as people of God, we have limitations. But I know a God that doesn't have any limitations. And he doesn't sleep at 3 o'clock in the morning. He's just as well awake at 3 a.m. as he is 3 p.m. And when it looks like I'm going under and I hear the voice of the devil telling me, it's over for you. You'll never preach again. You'll never teach again. You're going to lose your life. And sometimes I believe him. Sometimes I'm beat down. There's things I'm going to tell you that I don't like to tell you, but I'm not my own. I've been bought with a price. If it will help you, then I want to share it. When you come to Christ, that very moment that you come to him, you're born again and the power of God's inside of you. You have everything you need 
everything you need to conquer in every situation. I've been in law enforcement for many years now. And I go through training and I also go through annual in-service that I have to, you know, I have to do every year to keep my in-service. But if I don't have that training, that certification, and you put me out on the street, you can give me a gun belt. You can give me handcuffs. You can give me all the things that I need. But if I don't know how to utilize my resources, I'm not going to be able to do my job efficiently and proficiently, effectively. So I need training in order to do that. There's a lot of us, you are born again. You are filled with the Holy Ghost. You are a tongue talker, sanctified. But you don't know how to use the gifts that God gave you. You are dangerous to the realms of hell. And he knows if you ever figure that out, you're going to be a greater threat to him. So what God does, he lets you go through training, on-the-job training, so you can learn how to utilize the weapons of your warfare. Paul the Apostle said in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 through 6, he says the weapons of our warfare is not carnal. It's not guns and knives and bazookas and handcuffs and pepper spray. They're not carnal, but they're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Then he's going to tell you what the strongholds are. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Do you know the greatest battle that you ever fight in between your ears? The Bible says to keep your heart with all diligence for out of it proceeds the issues of life. For the abundance of the heart the mouth speaketh and we eat of the fruit of our lips. You know, people do the things they do. They act the way they act. They go the places they go. They live the way they live because of the way they think. The way they think. Jesus said, ye are my disciples indeed. If you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. God wants your perspective. God wants your mind. This has always been a matter of perspective. It started in the garden. It's always been a matter of perspective. Paul said, he said, lest I get exalted above measure, there was a thorn in the flesh given me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. For this I besought the Lord thrice, three times that it may depart from me. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. See, Paul was whining and complaining because he didn't know what was actually going on at the time. I'm so glad no matter how aged you are in the Lord, you can always learn something. I'm so glad that we don't get it all here. I'm so glad that it's on the job training. You grow as you go. That means you and me don't know everything. That means God still has the ability to awe you. God's still got the ability to show you things. No matter how high you get up, God's able to humble you and show you things that you never knew. So Paul, the thing that he run from, the thing that he dreaded, the thing that he hated, the thing that brought such misery to him, he besought God about it. He run from it. Then he learned through the revelation of God, through the voice of God, through the perspective of God, why am I running from something that I should embrace? It's because when I am weak, then that's really when I'm strong. Do you know why God allows you to wrestle with any? The Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against powers, against principalities, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. Take on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Have done all to stand against the wiles, the schemes, the tactics of the devil, the trickery, the fiery darts of the wicked, their thoughts, their imaginations, their high arguments that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Do you know Satan's relentless? Constantly trying to get your mind. 
trying to get your attention constantly. So Paul said, I'm sick of this. I'm always in peril. Peril in the deep. Peril among false brethren. Oh, my eyes give me trouble in Galatians. He said, my eyes are giving me trouble. People want to say that that thorn in his flesh was his eyes. No, it wasn't just his eyes. That was one of many. How do you think that he got the revelation about the thoughts and the imaginations? I'm telling you what, Paul knew a few things. Paul even had trouble with spiritual pride. He said, I know that it's not expedient. It's not a good thing that I should glory because of the revelations that come to. See, if you'll read it, it's right there. Paul had trouble with spiritual pride. And he was saying, God allowed me to have this thorn in the flesh to humble me so others won't see me any higher than they should and I won't consider myself any higher than I should. Do you know why God does this? So you'll never think it's you. So others will never think it's you. So everybody will see, you're just as weak as everybody else. You're just as vulnerable as everybody else. You need Jesus more than I do. And do you know what happens when they look at your life and they see the toils, they see the struggling, they see the things. It's time that we start being more open and more vulnerable and more truthful with the things we struggle with but we don't want to show that because we don't want people to see how weak we are. We act like Sister Susie Super Saint <laughs> or Herbie He-Man. We don't want people to see our faults. We don't want people to see our vulnerability because we're just like you. And I say it's time for ministers. I say it's time for the body of Christ to be real. God cleanse me from every false way. Let me glorify, gee, glory to God. Let me glorify you. It was you that delivered me from the power of darkness and translated me into the kingdom of your dear son, into the kingdom of light. It was you and not myself. I didn't save myself. I can't keep myself saved. It's the work of God inside of me. It's not me. And when we're not open about our vulnerabilities and our weaknesses, then we're trying to take the glory and we're insulting him. Jesus said, I only do what I see my father do. I only say what I hear my father say. So Paul come to the conclusion, the thing that I'm running from is the thing I should be embracing. And I said, God, I got to fight. There's no getting out of it. If you think you come to Christ and you're not going to fight the devil, you're sorely, sorely mistaken. That's actually what you've been called unto. It's actually what you've been called unto. So Paul, the thing that he once run from is now embracing because he understands something. He understands the thing that reveals my weakness pushes me towards my strength. So the thing that makes me look bad draws me to the person that can lift me up and make me look good by his power. Many years I worked, just an old boy, I worked at Giovanni's. And I remember this day, I was putting pizza boxes together. Can I preach a little bit? I was putting pizza boxes together. And I remember the Spirit of God said to me, he said, you know and I'm working. Anybody ever just work and your mind's on something else and you have a suddenly moment when the Holy Ghost speaks inside of you and you have no doubt that's the voice of my God speaking inside of me and you feel his power overwhelming you but everybody around you doesn't seem to be showing any kind of indication that they know God's there but you do because you're born again and because he's your God and because he lives inside of you and he reveals himself to you. He said, you know hell knows your name. And I'm just a babe in Christ at the time. He said, hell knows who you are. Remember the seven sons of Sceva? They had heard about Paul. They had heard about the apostles. So they run into a guy one day that was demon possessed. And they said, we adjure you to come out of him in the name of Paul, Jesus, whom Paul preaches. And that devil and the man said, I know Paul, and I definitely know Jesus, but who are you? <laughs> he said, who? He said, who are you? He said, who are you? 
And the one man whipped all seven of them and wounded them, sent them out naked running. Total humiliation. You better know Jesus. When you get in this, you better really know Jesus. The, the, the disciples come back one day and they were rejoicing. Said, Lord, even the spirits are subject to us through thy name. Jesus said, well, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven to the earth. He said, I give you power to tread upon serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing by any means will hurt you. He said, notwithstanding, do not rejoice in that the spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Do you know what he was saying there? He's saying, because your names are written there, you have power here. If your name wasn't there, you would have no power here. They'd laugh at you and then Jesus proved it in the book of Acts. Hey! Do you know what power you get when your name's put in a Lamb's Book of Life? No, I don't think you do. I don't think I do. If we did... We'd start seeing more things that Jesus done. We'd start seeing more things that the apostles done by the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's coming. You need to get yourself ready because that's coming. It's coming. Logos and lions. Rhema and serpents. Like I said, I'm not going to get through all this today. I can already see that. You ever have so much information, Pastor? And you want it to come out, but it can't going to come out until God wants it to. Oh, there's so many things I would like to give you. So many things I'd like to give I'm talking about things that, man, sweat, tears. So many things I've been through that had I not went through it, it's good that I've been afflicted, that I might learn thy precepts, oh God. The same thing Paul learned. But if you look at a lion and a serpent, their mouth is their destructive device. It's their mouth. That's what will kill you. It's the serpent's mouth. When it bites you, it injects its venom. It's the lion's mouth that if he gets you in his mouth, he will devour you. Both the serpent and the lion, their destructive device is their mouth. The lion will devour you, and if you'll study up on a serpent, it swallows its prey whole. Didn't it say? Satan as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And you are at the top of the list, my brother. You, every one of us, are at the top of the list. But you see, I've got good news for you. I remember there was a day that Samson was going down to Timnath and he took his parents with him. And along the way, the parents wasn't with him. Oh, what God does in your secret time when you steal away. The Bible says the Father says pray in secret and the Father will see you in secret and reward you openly. So Samson left mom and dad and then went on down to Timnath alone, just God and him. And the Bible says along the way that there was a young lion that had roared against him. You got an enemy that's roaring against you every day, sissy. Every day, there's times I got him roaring against me before I even get up. There's times through the night that I'm trying to sleep and I got him talking into my head and already got me scared of what's going to happen the next day and anxious of what I'm going to do about this and what I'm going to do about that, trying to get me to insult God by not trusting God like I should. Roaring against me, my brother. But there's an awesome thing that takes place when the enemy roars against you. He said when that young lion roared against him, the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Somebody say the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Don't worry about it, child of God. When the lion starts roaring, when he starts telling you you're going to lose your wife, you're going to lose your husband, you're going to lose them to death, you're going to lose them divorced, you're going to lose your children, your lost loved ones are not going to get saved, oh, you're going to lose your job, and he starts running his mouth and he begins to roar against you, that's okay, let him roar because not too long after, the Spirit of the Lord is going to come mightily upon you. And the Bible says that he tore him. Samson with his own hands tore him in two. 
like you would rent a little kid, a little lamb. Not a kid, not a child, so don't you kids get, no, no kids get in here, get nervous. Then it makes me remember when Samson, when he goes down, an incident. And I want you to think about this. Remember the riddle? Remember the riddle? When Samson said, out of the eater came meat, and out of the strong came sweetness. He would have never had honey unless he'd have killed the lion. You can't have honey until you kill your lions. God means for you to kill your lions, my brother. You see, he said, I send you forth as sheep among wolves. But you see what you got to realize, you are the prey and the enemy is the predator until the line of the tribe of Judah stirs up in you and then he makes you the predator and makes the devil the prey. Amen. See, it has nothing to do with you. It has to do with who lives in you. And God will allow you to face the enemy like a sheep and let the, lion, or let the wolf rise up so that the lion will rise up in you. I bet you, who do you know has got the best roar? You'll never eat honey until you kill the lion. You were meant to kill the lion. And if the devil could do what he's saying he's going to do to you, why don't he just shut up and do it? Because he needs your cooperation. He needs you to listen to him. He needs you to be afraid. He needs you to believe him because he works on that and he'll bring it to pass if you let him. Never stop fighting. You want honey? That's what Paul figured out. Paul said, I'm not going to get to eat honey until I fight the lion. See, Paul's whole mindset changed. Once he realized, in order to get strong, i got to fight. Do you know this? I went through, I'm going to come back to that. Do you know? And you're probably going to be surprised when I tell you this. A time in my life, it was like hell on earth. I'm going to be open and honest and vulnerable to you for a minute because I want to help you. Here I am, a police officer, and I'd always fought with this from the time I was born again, and you do too if you'll admit it. But this come to a head to a point, it was unbearable. I thought I was going insane. Constantly, I know what it feels like to be hopeless. Here I am, a born again, Holy Ghost filled minister. And I'm going through this. I thought, God, am I possessed? Read about John Bunyan. Pilgrim's Progress. Read about John Bunyan. And I, I learned. I would have never learned these things had I not went through this. And I realized Heman in Psalms 88. David went through it. Job went through it. If you're ever going to be used of God, you're going to go through things that are totally unbearable. I thought, I'm lost. I felt this feeling of hopelessness. The devil telling me, you're not saved. Your Calvinism come in. You're predestined to hell. Calvinism is a lie out of hell. Don't you ever believe that stuff. You have free will. Tell me you're predestined to hell. I felt totally hopeless. I would find myself. I couldn't sleep. Here I am working, my brother. I got a gun belt around my waist. And nobody sees what I'm going through. They see some of it. And so I finally broke down. I'd find myself laying in the bathroom, bathroom floor in the morning in a fetal position crying before I had to get ready to work, dreading to go to work, not knowing how, I'm, how am I going to make it through this day. I had no hope, no peace, no joy. It was total, utter despair. I know what it's like to think about suicide. The devil tell me you're going to lose your wife. You're going to lose your children. You're going to lose your job. You're going to end up in a mental institution and I'm going to make you stroke out and you're going to watch another man take your wife and raise your kids. Let's just be real here. I'm going to turn you into this. I'm going to turn you into an alcohol, alcoholic. And I don't even like alcohol. <laughs> I'm going to turn you into an adulterer. I'm going to turn you into a fornicator. I'm going to turn you into a homosexual. I'm going to turn you into this and that. I felt like God, if there's anything else out there that's wicked, I don't know what it is. It felt like every wicked thing that's known to man was attacking me. I said, God, what is this? I mean, I, I was going insane. And here I am. You remember calling me that time? Here I am. 
a police officer in a position of authority. I mean, my God, man, they put a, a gun belt around my waist and I'm on a teaker and on the edge of sanity. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, God will take you places and he'll let you get stuck there till you realize you can't get yourself out. He's the only one that can. Why does God do that? So you'll never forget who gets the glory. So I'm like, God, what is this? I mean, I've never, it's the most horrible thing. I lost my mom, I've lost my dad, I lost an uncle, it was like a dad to me. You could, you could put all that together and magnify it a thousand times and you think I'm exaggerating, we're preachers and we exaggerate. No, I'm not exaggerating. It wouldn't touch it. To really believe that you were cast off from God, that God didn't love you, you were done. But you know now i got a lot more empathy, my brother. I can tell people what hell feels like. Because you know what? Hell's a place that if you don't know Jesus Christ, you will go to. You'll never call on God again. You may call, but he'll never hear. The Bible says you're cut off from his hand whom he remembers no more. If you go out of this world, if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ or you once knew him and backslid, you better get back. You better come because you'll go to a place and I know this is not popular preaching but hell's real. Jesus died to save us from something and I'm telling you it's death and hell. And it's the lake of fire which is the second death and once you go there, you'll never get out. You're eternally doomed and damned forever to a place of incomprehensible Pain and sorrow and horror. You can magnify what you fear a million times here and it'll not touch one second in hell. Your mind cannot comprehend the fear and the horror that will take a hold of your soul. Not to mention the lake of fire. Not to mention the physical pain that you'll sense there. But the emotional pain. You'll be cast off. There's no love there. There's no peace there. There's no joy. There's no forming a committee and saying, hey, we can get through this together. Most of the things you face here, there's other people that go through it too and you can pull together and draw strength from one another. That's actually what the scripture says, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. I draw strength from you when I know that you go through something similar to what I go through. It gives me strength to know that I'm not an oddball. It's okay, he's going through it too. There won't be any committees in hell, social committees. Help me get through this. Everybody will be individually suffering torment themselves. There will be no comfort. There will be no solace. There will be no hope to ever get out. So I urge you here, if you don't know that you belong to God by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, you need to make sure today that you do. You trying to scare me, preacher? Well, yes, I am. Yes, I am. In all honesty, yes, I am. Yes, I want. The fear of God is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But I was in a place where I never thought I'd get out, sissy. And here I am, born again. Can I, can I preach a little longer? Here I'm in a place, my dear brother, that I think I'll never get out. Like I said, I'm a prominent member of our civil society. <laughs> People look at me and thought, but it was starting to take its toll on me. I couldn't hide it any longer. It come to a place to where, and I need help. And that's exactly where I needed to be. The Bible says, greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world but I would never know that. You would never know that. Sometimes we as children of God, when God pours it out on us, we can get a little haughty and a little heady and a little high-minded thinking it's of us. But God's got ways to take his children through things that we never forget, that it's him. And that we never forget to give all glory to him. People need to see Jesus sustaining you. 
People need to hear you say, he's the strength of my heart. He's the strength of my life. Power belongeth unto God. Might belongeth unto God. It's not anything in of myself. When Jesus used Peter in the book of Acts to raise the impudent man up, when the people were looking so earnestly upon them, he said, why are you looking at me so earnestly as if i done anything by my holiness? This man stands before you because of Jesus Christ. And that's what we got to start declaring. Today I stand before you when the devil told me I'd never preach again. When I stand before you today when the devil says you're going to hell. And the devil said this and he said that. I stand before you today and declare that I'm born again. My name's in the book of life because of Jesus Christ and the power of his spirit. See, we think just when we come to Jesus, that's the only testimony we got. I'm telling you, when you come to Jesus Christ and you make him the Lord and Savior of your life by the invitation of the Spirit of God, then your testimonies just begin. Just like you were born into the earth physically. You had life, but you had a whole lot of growing to do. Peter said, don't count it a strange thing when you're tried by these fiery trials as though some strange thing happened to you. It's time, children of God. I counted that a strange thing. I thought I knew something until God took me there and realized I didn't know what I thought I knew. But I knew him. And he knows me. And the fact that he got me out of there is proof that I know him and he knows me. God will take you places to prove to your own heart you really know me and I really know you. And that's the greatest gift that you've got that you can say, I know him and he knows me. That's the reason why that song means so much to me. He knows my name. My God. Somebody say, he knows my name. And to some of you all that are here today, and you don't understand why that means so much to us, when you're standing at the great white throne judgment, you'll realize, but it'll be too late. Don't wait till you're standing before Almighty God and you have no covering for your sin. Don't wait before you stand before the great white throne to hear God judge you for every sin, every wicked thought, every wicked desire, every wicked word, every wicked deed to remember back why we are so excited now that we know him and he knows us. Don't wait. Because you know what? God will remind you, it'll, it'll already be in your heart that you sit here this day And you heard the preaching that you heard. There'll be saying, there'll be no saying, I didn't know, God. I didn't know. You know what? You're going to be in the presence of sheer truth. There won't be no lying there. I've had people that I had them on camera. You done this, and that wasn't me. I said, but I got three witnesses here that saw you. They got you on camera. Wasn't me. Sometimes I can't believe the audacity of people. Do you know what? When you stand before God, you won't be able to say, wasn't me. There'll be no excuse. You're standing in the presence of sheer truth. You're talking about a truth serum. <laughs> there won't be no line there. There won't be no hiding anything. You're standing in the presence of complete light, perfect light. There'll be nothing hid. I want you to think about one second. Think about how terrifying that is. And the Spirit's got me off on this. I had I, I was going another direction. I, I'll get back to it. But the Spirit, I'm serious. If you're here today, you're here for a reason. If you don't know Jesus or you've backslidden, the Bible says, the servant that knew to do his Lord's will and did it not shall be beaten with many stripes, while the servant that didn't know to do his Lord's will will be beaten with few stripes. You know what that means? It means you know to do good and do it not. It's sin unto you. If you've been born again and you've walked away from God for another man or another woman or for this reason or that reason and you're not with God, you've not repented and you've backslid. Don't tell me that once saved, always saved stuff because I can take the scriptures and shred that up one side and down the other. If it took free will to get saved, it takes free will to stay saved. God didn't make little robots. If you're here and you knew Jesus Christ and you backslid, 
you are in terrible danger. But I got good news for you. I got good news for you. You can repent. You can repent. The best news I ever heard when Jesus come out of the wilderness, he said, repent and believe the gospel. You know what gospel means? It means good news. Do you know what the good news is? It is you can repent. See, under the old law, if you committed certain sins and adultery was one of them, you were killed and you went to hell. Am I I telling the truth? Yeah, Yeah, I'm telling you the truth. But they want to say you got a lot of people out here, they don't want to repent, but they want to believe. I think that's called liberalism. (laughs) You got a lot of people says, I believe in Jesus. So I'll continue on in my homosexuality. Oh, that's not politically correct, Pastor. I'm not not striving for political correctness. I'm striving for kingdom correctness. I'm striving for kingdom correctness. It's okay if I got me a woman on the side as long as my, my wife knows about it. Or my husband knows about it. See, you don't think this stuff happens. You wouldn't believe the people's houses I go into. Prominent people. Doctors, lawyers, people that are up to do here in society. You wouldn't believe some of the things they do. Yes, it happens. And I believe that we're living in one of the most wicked times to ever live. The good news is you can repent. You can repent. If you're here today and you've backslid, God's got me on that, Pastor. You're here today. Church, pray. Just pray for a second while I preach. You're here today for a reason. Pray, church, why? Spirit's got me. I was going an entirely different direction. If you're here today and you've backslidden on Christ, oh, I can hear you in my, why did I come today? You come today because God loves you. Because unlike you and me not being faithful to him, he's faithful to us. He said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Jesus' spirit will strive you with you to the day you take your last breath. And if you take your last breath, having rejected him and not repent and come back to Christ, you will die and go into a devil's hell and it will be a lot worse on you than it would have been the person that never knew Jesus. God's dealing with somebody today that knew him and walked away. You need to take this very serious because God in his infinite love and his sovereignty made sure you were here today so that you could hear this message and know just like the prodigal son, I have sinned. I will go back to my father and say, Father, I have sinned against you in heaven. Make me as one of your servants. And when the father saw him afar off, the father come running. And he wrapped his arms around him. He put a robe around him signifying that he was accepted back into the family and a ring on his finger. My son was dead and he's alive again. He's come home. You can come back. You can come back. So I urge you today, if you don't know Jesus Christ, come back. You feel embarrassed? You feel, I'd rather be embarrassed here. I'd rather be ashamed here than to stand before him and be ashamed. Please let that be the last of your worries. John, have you ever backslidden? Yes. As a young a young person, I walked with Christ and backslid. I ended up dying twice and God revived me, kept me out of hell. A drug overdose. You're playing on dangerous ground. Come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. Can I get the singers to come up? I had uh, some, I had some other direction I want to go, and I'm going to finish up here just shortly. If we can just get the singers get to play something softly. I want to go into Logos and Rhema. Logos is the written word of God. Rhema is the spoken word of God. And you children of God, when you get your Rhema, hang on to it. Oh, so much that I want to say, but I believe God wanted me to go this direction. 
Pastor, am I on right track, you think? And maybe sometime you'll have me back and I can finish this message. But as the church prays, as the church prays, I want to appeal to the person you know you're lost. You know that you, you need to come back. And it's not by some chance that you're here. You know that God ordained this. You know that God set this up. And you know that you're here because God is giving you another opportunity to come back. See, because you left him doesn't mean he left you. See, Jesus can't lie. The scripture says he's the truth. And he made a promise. He will strive with you. If you've once known him, he will strive with you to the day you take your last breath. He will try to get you to come back home. It's a love that we can't comprehend. Every now and then, we get slight aromas of it. But if you sense the presence of God touching your heart, and you know that you, and I'm saying it, if you've never known Christ, <laughs> Jesus died to save us from something. I didn't come to church to hear about hell today. I didn't come to church to hear about the lake of fire today. Well, you know what? You'll never seek an answer until you realize you got a problem. And I'm here to tell you, if you don't know Jesus, you've got the worst problem there is to have. Spirit of God, have your way. You have the worst problem. There's no problem that you can have on the face of the earth worse than the problem that you have. It's a sin problem. And it's a problem that will cost you your soul. It's a problem that when you stand before Jesus, you'll not be able to enter into heaven. But my wife went. My husband went. My children are in there. And you'll hear him say, Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Is that what you want to hear? My God, no, it's not. Do you want to know that the, your loved ones, they went into heaven without you? My God, nobody wants that. God doesn't want that. You don't want that. Your family don't want that. You remember the rich man when him and Lazarus died? Do you remember? He said in hell he lifted up his eyes. And he begged. The Bible says he was tormented in that flame. Do you know? You'll be able to see there. You'll be able to hear. You'll be able to taste and touch and smell and feel. You have all your five senses there. Please, church, pray. God's dealing with somebody. You'll have all your senses there. As a matter of fact, I believe they'll be heightened. You'll be more sensitive there. And you think that it's just the physical pain. No, the emotional pain. You will be tormented on a level, spirit, soul, and body. It's beyond your comprehension. Don't go there to find out what this preacher is saying. Don't go there. Do not find out what this means by experience. I might be the only one that ever tells you don't go to hell. It's the worst curse somebody could put on you telling you go there. Don't. You don't have to. God gave you a free will and He gave you the gift of His Son. And church, I wanted to go another direction, but the Spirit's got me on this. There's somebody here that your soul is weighed in a balance. You may go out of here and this may be the last church service that you ever experience. This may be the last time that you ever get beckoned by the Holy Spirit to come back home. You that have never known Christ, this may be the last time that the Holy Spirit ever draws you again before you take your last breath. And like the rich man, you lift your eyes up. Hey, my God, my God. You lift your eyes up out of hell. Tormented. You'll still love the people on the earth. He said, please let somebody, let Lazarus go back. Somebody warn my five brothers that they don't come to this horrible place. Please, somebody, Abraham, let Lazarus go back. They'll believe if somebody rose from the dead. Abraham told him they've got Moses and the prophets. they got the scriptures. 
They're not going to believe though somebody raised from the dead. But you've got somebody that rose from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead so that you don't have to go to hell. Why don't you, I've got a good idea. God's got a good idea. Why don't you, listen, why don't you get saved? And why don't you tell your five brothers, tell your wife and your husband, tell your children now so they don't go there. Don't depend on somebody to do your job. I'm going to ask you as everybody bows their head, there's people here that don't know Jesus. And don't say, he's not focusing on me because I backslid. I've never come to Jesus. You're just as in bad shape. Though the one who knew Christ and backslid and turned away from him for, the, for this world, maybe it's drinking, maybe it's drugs, maybe it's sexual sin, maybe it's this or that. I don't know. But I do know this. If you'll confess your sin, he's faithful and he's just to forgive you and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness you've not done anything that he can't forgive you of the fact that you're sitting there with breath in your body there's hope for all those that are still alive there's hope all you gotta do is come back Jesus you know I believe you're the son of God I believe that you died for me and God rose you from the dead I'm not gonna ask you to come up here but I would say, if you're there in your seat right now, well, preacher, I've never seen it done like this. Well, let's not put God in a box. If Jesus' Spirit is dealing with you right now, you can right there where you're at. You don't come and shake my hand. You don't have to come up here in front of everybody. Some people are just backward. It's not that they're ashamed of the Lord. Why don't you in your heart right now, why don't you just say, Jesus, forgive me. Right now, why don't you pray and say, I'm tired of running, Lord. I'm tired of being afraid. See, because you've been afraid. When you go to sleep at night, you think, is this the night that I may not wake up in the morning? You go to work, is this the day it might happen and I leave this world? You're not happy. You've not got any real peace. You try to drown it out with drugs and relationships or drinking. Maybe you're trying to drown it out with working more. You're trying to drown out that voice that's drawing you back to Him. But you can't drown it out. And He keeps calling. And He keeps calling to bring you home. And you keep resisting. What if this is the last time? What if if you go out of this place today and He stops beckoning? What if he stops drawing? What if this was your last day on earth, your last week on earth? Where will you open your eyes up? Will you open your eyes up and see the king and be in the presence of the Lord? Or in hell will you lift up your eyes? So right now as the church is praying and everybody's heads bowed, I would say this. Jesus, a simple prayer, pray from your heart. Say, Jesus, I love you, Lord. And I'm sorry that I strayed away. I'm sorry that I backslid on you. I'm sorry, Father, that I've sinned against you. Will you please come back into my heart? Would you please accept me back in? Would you please forgive me? You know, I trust, I put my trust in your old rugged cross and that you took my sin. And I know that God raised you from the dead to prove to me in the world that the sacrifice that you made was accepted. I believe, Jesus. I believe. Forgive me, Lord. It's as simple as that. Please do it right now. Please do it right now. That's for not just those who have backslid. That's for those who have never known Christ. You don't have to come up here and shake my hand. You don't have to come up here and do anything. Right where you're at. How much better? How good can it get? God knows that Satan will whisper in your mind, you don't want to go up there in front of all them people. Well, they thought you were right. You don't want to go up there and everybody see you. Okay then, he's saying, sit right where you're at. It's not the position of your body, it's the position of your heart. God's saying, right where you're at, <laughs> right where you're at, just call on my name. Whosoever, this is what Jesus is saying to you, if you'll call on my name, I'll save you. Right now, I'll save you. 
going to give you just a minute before I ask the pastor to come. I'm going to give you just a minute. Think about what was just said. You've got an opportunity. What if sin, Lord, sin to my five brothers, somebody, so my brothers don't come here. Why don't you talk to your brothers here and now? Why don't you get saved and talk to your family? Do you know your children are watching you? Do you know your children will listen to you? Do you know we prepare our children for college and to meet the demands of making a living, but we're not preparing our children for eternity? Do you know, Mom and Dad, that they're watching you, they're listening to you? Do you know you could be the very one that leads your children into hell? Do you know when they stand before God one day that they may accuse you? You know, God may accuse you and your children may end up in hell. God forbid. But let's, we're, this is real. This is not a Sunday morning church service alone. This is real. This is reality. What if you lead your children to hell? What if you lead your children to the lake of fire? What if your children one day stand before God Almighty and they are judged and they hear the most horrifying words a human being can ever hear? Depart. Depart from me, you worker of iniquity. I never knew you. I'm going to ask this. If anybody prayed that prayer, would you please, while everybody's head's bowed, would you please raise your hand? You don't have to say nothing. Just raise your hand and say, that'll show that you prayed that prayer. Thank God for those hands. Thank God for those hands. See, the Bible says if you believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead and you confess him with your mouth, you'll be saved. You just made a confession. You called on Jesus Christ and you lifted your hands in confession. Please get with us, get with the pastor after church and make sure, just let the person next to you say, just let them hear you say, it was me, I accepted Jesus. It was me, I come home. Is there anybody else? We've already had people raise their hand. Is there anybody else that can say, I've come back to Jesus today. I've come home. Well, let's go this far. Is there anybody that would say, Pastor, would you please remember me when you pray? I know that this act doesn't save me, but I want the church to remember me when you pray, that God will have mercy on me and help me to have the courage to come back home. Is there anybody that will raise their hand and say, please remember me when you pray? Remember me. Thank God for those hands. Thank God for those hands. We will remember you, but remember this. It's going to take you. Love demands free will, and free will demands options. God is love, and he gives you a free will. He will not make you serve him, but I'm telling you, Anything you think wor here is worth missing heaven, Satan has got you deceived. There is nothing here worth miss missing heaven. What would it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his soul? I'm going to say that one more time and I'm, as the pastor comes. Come on up, pastor. I want you to think about this. What does it profit a person if they gain the whole world and yet lose their soul? Because whatever you gain here, you can have everybody bow into your beck and call, have anything and everything you want at any time, but I promise you it's temporary and it's coming to an end. But Jesus is forever. Eternity is forever. Heaven is forever. Hell is forever. This is not what I come to church for today. I wanted to hear a message how I could pay my tithes and get rich. I wanted to hear a message of how I can feel good. Well, the Spirit, He started that. But there's people here that come back to Jesus Christ. And there's people here the Holy Spirit's dealing with. And you need to know that God loved you enough to make sure you were here today so you could know that He stopped a message for His children just so you could know, I still love you. I will forgive you of what you've done regardless of what you think you've done. And Satan's telling you you can't be forgiven. It's a lie. I'm telling you, Jesus' blood is able to forgive you. You're listening to the lie. Don't go to hell. Pastor. You've heard the word of the Lord today. Some have responded. Thank God for that. 
others have asked for prayer. Let that be a matter of great significance for us who believe that there are people in our congregation this morning who are concerned about their soul. Let us also be concerned. Let us pray for the lost. Amen. Pray for our families. The Lord is coming soon. This stuff is about to be wrapped up. Amen. Let us be ready. Have you appreciated the ministry of John today? If so, would you just give him a, a hand? Thank you. Thank you. Amen. Praise the Lord. I want my sons and daughters, children and grandchildren, brothers and sisters, I want them to be saved. Lord, send a John Workman to where they are with a word that will prick their hearts. Amen. If you receive Christ today, come and talk to us after service. Amen. Let us know the decision that you've made and we'll celebrate with you. Could we stand together? Lord, what an awesome place it has been today to sit at your table, to hear your word, to be able to worship you with brothers and sisters of Christ. Thank you for this family. Thank you for this home that you've provided for us. Let us not take it nor one another for granted, for all are important to you. And we all belong to you, Lord. So I pray that you will go with them. As we leave this place, Lord, may you constantly remind us that you are with us and you are for us. Bless these people. Throughout this week, at work, on their job, in their homes, wherever they may go, May the presence of the Lord be there. Bring us back, Lord, at the appointed time. But put a fire in us, O Lord, that cannot be quenched. Let us so hunger and thirst for righteousness that we cannot resist the house of the Lord, the presence of the Lord, the word of the Lord and the people of the Lord. I love you today, and I thank you for every soul that was saved, every backslider that came home, and every person that responded to your word today. I give you praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you Thursday night, 7 o'clock.